Today I invite you all to continue our journey towards saving Faerun from the rise of Tiamat. I also want to invite you to join us at Lutzen Dice Inn, our Discord server. It was a sad and barren place, but one of my lovely subscribers offered help, so they added rooms and voice channels and even a bot who plays music. Now it's a fun place to chat, share stories, characters, memes and whatnot. Maybe you're looking for an online gaming group who have a channel for that too. You want to show off your painting skills? Go ahead. You can find the link in the description. You're watching Lutz and Dice and I'm your bard, Folkert. Even though it's a part of one campaign, in my opinion Rise of Tiamat is a slightly better book than the previous one. At least because it was a lot more fun to prepare and run. There is more freedom, more space for creativity, and separate chapters of this adventure can be easily pulled out and used in your own homebrew game, which I believe to be a really handy quality of a D&D product. The White Dragon Lair in the Sea of Moving Ice is a nicely detailed location that's going to be interesting to explore in any D&D context, as well as that of a Green Dragon in the Misty Forest. Tomb of Darius feels like a classic location with mummies and yuan Ti. to me it has strong Neverwinter Nights vibes. Zonthal's Tower was just a blast, to me it has something iconic to it, speaking of Dungeons & Dragons experience. So at least the locations and static content, so to speak, is great and fun, but regarding handling the overarching story as a DM, we're going to have a lot of work to do. Thankfully, the modular nature of the adventure does not stand in our way. From the moment that you pick up this book, I suggest that you perceive it as a very light guideline with a bunch of content to use. I really think it would be easier if you don't stick to the suggested timelines and faction scoreboard rules. Use it as well as the experience from running the previous book as an inspiration. Upon finishing the Horde of the Dragon Queen, it might so happen that your story has a very unique momentum and you should try to adapt the intro to Rise of Tiamat so you don't force the narrative and don't neglect some of the character choices. So one way or another the party will end up at the council meeting, and that's going to be a starting point for almost every separate adventure in the book. Now I want you to consider whether you even want the council to be a thing in your game. It's presented as a core element that drives the story, but honestly it might not fit to each and every group. Maybe your group consists of assassins and barbarians who couldn't care less about politics, it can actually become a boring part for the players, because they are expected to become like ambassadors or someone who will bring some sense into the council when some of the leaders, like the Elven King, are going to be blinded by pride for example. It's all cool, but just don't forget about your players' interests and whether they would enjoy this type of gameplay. Speaking of gameplay, I'm not a fan of the council scoreboard. I would use it as a rough guideline, maybe it sounds obvious, but I would definitely not expose the metagame element element of this scoreboard. Having the players know that there is some table with points, it would normally distract from the healthy narrative. Depends on your style, of course. So depending on your preferred pacing and style, you could start each session as a new adventure, having all the council stuff as a briefing part, like a short synopsis, a story hook. I did the opposite. I did it the way I always do. And I often suffer from this, but I can't help. I did tons of research on Waterdeep. I made this city my home for a year in my dreams. I actually bought an old old second edition box set just to dive into the lore. And you know what? I don't regret it. I sort of fell in love with the city. I've provided detailed descriptions of the streets, the way the pieces were escorted to the palace, they saw different leaders arrive in the courtyard, they were shown their chambers, they had some private time with Sir Isteval and Lady Silverhand throughout the campaign, they were presented with their own riding griffons eventually, they visited Falkert Silverstring's concert in the Field of Triumph, they've witnessed the Midwinter Festival, one of them had a romantic weekend in the Fairwinds villa with their NPC lover, and much more. It's these beautiful moments of peace that made all those battles worth fighting, and we had a wonderful time playing it all out. So of course it's up to you how much of Waterdeep you should include in your game, but if you'd like to dive into details you're going to need some additional resources like Waterdeep Dragon Heist for example. Alternatively, you can of course make this city your own and use your imagination to fill it up. Now I want to provide my thoughts on approaching those separate adventures in the book. It's something I've done and I think it works a lot better. I'll just voice it and you decide what to use. At some point, give your PCs opportunities to send out scouts, especially if they are harpers. This will make them feel 
feel less like errand boys for the lords and more like ace level heroes that can handle things. They might task a scout with finding a dragon mask or a cult leader and you can adapt the result of this mission into a hook for another adventure. Advice number two, be sure to reflect the player's progress in the world. For instance, if their arcane brotherhood joins the war, show it. When the pieces return from another quest, tell them how the wizards of Luskan apply defensive spells on the walls. Same goes for every force that joins the fight. War camps growing under the city walls, training, marching and so on, perhaps another giant castle in the skies. Giants may be returning from a battle, dragging a dead body of a dragon behind. The dwarves might bring some artillery to the water deep defenses. You get the idea. Point number three dragon masks. So I am very confused about the place of dragon masks in this story. Several adventures involve active search of a mask, and every time the players are left with nothing, they will spend one or two sessions hunting down a worm speaker, capture or kill him, fight a dragon, get some treasure, and then find out that it was a waste of time. And it happens three times. They go for Varim the White, he tells them that the mask is already at the Well of Dragons. Other than that, he's pretty useless. They go for Naren Vane, no green dragon mask either. Once again, it was just a fight that is sort of helpful because the forest is now safe and the elves are going to join the war now, but the motivations and benefits are so vaguely formulated that the player might have a hard time feeling a satisfying victory, even understanding that it is indeed a victory. The third time they go for a blue dragon mask, and they get it, they are really happy now three times and the third one is finally a win, and then they find out that the mask is a forgery. I mean, come on, it's a straight up trolling, who would enjoy that? And more than that, looking at the mechanics that the authors provide for the masks, I don't see any reason not to give a couple of masks to the players. It will assemble in a Super Dragon Queen mask if there are as many as two separate masks. The rules for weakening the Dragon Queen doesn't even state that the amount of masks has any importance at all. It's either the Super Mask is 100% complete or it's not. Correct me if I'm wrong, but if it's true, then this all doesn't even matter. The players already have one mask they got in Skyreach Castle, presumably. The super mask will already be incomplete. Any extra masks won't make any difference. They will just become handy magic items to give resistance and charisma advantage. I explained to my players that each missing mask will make Tiamat weaker upon arrival, and I've let them have two of those three masks. The white one got into the hands of the Zentarim, and we had a nice session that I came up with. My players had to infiltrate a noble house, investigate, get themselves invited for a party, and steal the mask from a secret vault. It was super fun. The other one was the blue one, and I just ignored that it was a forgery. And eventually my players had some nice role-playing moments with chromatic dragons while wearing those masks. Now, speaking of that ritual, let's talk about sacrifices. One thing I did is I named a number, and I had reconnaissance keeping my players up to date as for how many prisoners the cult presumably has. I used it as a clock tool. I wanted my players to understand that the clock is ticking, but they're still in control of managing their time. They have time to gather forces and find another mask, and the prisoners will live until the moment the cult has enough of them, as well as enough treasure and all the masks they can lay their hands upon. Now this is information that players can operate with and make choices. They could try and assign military forces into a region to free a cluster of prisoners about to be escorted south, so that they can win some time. They can forge a fake mask themselves to screw with the cult somehow. I hope it makes sense. And this is going to be it for today. We're going to have a closer look at each of those separate locations in the following videos. Be sure to subscribe, hit the bell button, and check out my Patreon page so we can support the channel and get something cool in return. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.